Good morning. It's good to see you guys this morning. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Pastor Scott and Kathy are in, I don't know if I'm supposed to tell you, but they're in Cocoa Beach, Florida. Yeah, which I've never been there, but I heard it's pretty nice because it's a beach. It's got to be nice, right? <laughs> Except in Maine. Maine has a lot of rocky beaches that aren't really beaches. They're just really cold and the wind comes up. It's not, Maine's not like everywhere else, right? But they're in uh, Cocoa Beach, Florida. They said to say, hey, he said he's here in spirit. Which, if you know Pastor Scott, means that, yeah, means that he's not thinking, he's, he's having fun on the beach. That's what he's doing. But uh, that's good. They, they need a weekend. He said, man, I just need a weekend. I said, well, then go. What are you doing? Go take one. So please pray for them uh, this week as you're thinking about um, just your prayer life, whatever you're thinking about. Just think of Pastor Scott and Kathy. Um, it's kind of a funny week, right? It's, a, it's been a tough weekend for me, personally, I got to tell you. Uh, we had Dixie graduate this weekend and Scott graduate this weekend. And then next weekend is Connor, right? And then I'm, there's a whole bunch of other ones. But I got to tell you, this is our first, um, our first big group of seniors that are leaving our group, right, that are, that are aging out. We've always had one or two at, at a time, but now we have like five or six, which is, which is tough. This is tough stuff. Parents, how do you do this? Like, they're, they're, I, they're not even my kid, like my real kids, and I'm crying at their graduation. Like, so I don't know how you guys do this, parents. I don't, I'd be a, I'm going to be a wreck when my, Christina, I'm not even going to be able to go to our kids' graduation because they're going to be like, is that guy okay? Like, is there some, tr- <laughs> like, is something, is he dying? Like, what's wrong with them? Like, no, I'm just so happy. I'm so proud of them. That's going to be me. I'm, I'm going to sit all the way up in the front with just a whole big box of tissues. Just, just leave him up there. He's fine. He's, he's just weak. But I got to tell you, everybody that graduated this weekend uh, and people that will next weekend, I'm very proud of you guys. Very proud of you guys. Uh, yes, th- yeah, we can do that, yeah. I, t- I tell them all the time that uh, adults have left churches um, over smaller issues than these kids deal with. And there they are. I'm not supposed to cry yet. Proud of you guys. Very proud of you guys, so love you. That's my shameless plug for the youth for the day. Um, There might be a couple other ones. It's been a real emotional week, I'm not going to lie to you. So just lock in, be prepared. Um, We're headed out. So this week, I want to talk to you about Jesus. Is that all right? Jesus. And we've been talking about encounters with Jesus, and this today we're going to talk about the last earthly encounter that anybody had with Jesus. So when he ascends to heaven, the last thing he leaves the disciples and the people that were there with and, uh, and what all that means for us today, okay? So um, let's start with the scripture. It's Acts 1, 6 through 17, or 14. There's no PowerPoint this morning because a lot of what I'm going to talk about this morning is distraction. And so uh, it, like youth group, like when I have to tell everybody to put their phones away, <laughs> We used to have like a little phone bucket, you know, that didn't go over very well. Try to take a phone from a 14-year-old girl. I'm serious. You think they're small and weak. They're not small and weak. If you motivate them well enough, they are, they are loud and powerful, all right? So the, the phone bucket didn't work very well, but um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about this morning is about distraction and how we get, we get off center and then where that ends up taking us, how one degree off can end up over here when you were going this direction. And so there's no slides up there for you. I'll just read it to you, old-fashioned style. I promise you, this is what it says in the Bible. If you brought a Bible, you can fact-check me, or you can just ask LaVon, because she has it memorized. So, yeah. (laughs) Uh, Acts 1, 6 through 14. It says, They gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the time and the dates the Father has set by his own authority, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking up at the sky intently as he was going when two men suddenly appeared dressed in white. Men of Galilee, they said. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. 
So the, then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. And when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas, son of James. Not the Judas you're thinking of, a different one. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. So there it is. Jesus has just told them his final command, and he is ascended, has ascended to heaven, which, whoa, that'd be cool to watch, I'm just saying, and ascends to heaven, and they're standing there, like, staring in the sky. These two random dudes show up, dressed in white, and they're like, hey, go do what he said to do. What do you, what do you mess around with? And so they go, and they go, and they start praying, right? You can really break this whole passage down into three, three things, three things that happen here. There's a final command from Jesus, right? And there's a call to action, and there's prayer. Those three things, and that's how we're going to kind of work through this. So first, there's a final command from Jesus. Uh, final words are really important to us, right? If you, if you look up, just Google famous last words, so many come up, which means that we think it's important to write down people's last words. It's something romantic about the idea of this is the last thing I'm going to say to anyone, the last thing that I'm going to be able to deliver, that, to tell people what I really want my life to be about. Right? They taught us in English that you lead with your middle argument, your middle strength argument, you put the, your weakest argument in the middle, and then you finish with your strongest and that's basically what people try to do, right? With their last words, they want to have that, that moment. Which, by the way, um, it, from my own experience with how I've seen people pass, you don't always get that moment. So I wouldn't bank on that, by the way. If you're waiting to like, I'll, I'll get saved like on my deathbed. Well, you never know when your deathbed's going to be. So I'm just saying you might want to just take care of that now and then just write something funny down. Like say a joke before you die. That'd be funny, right? Like, hey, come here. Knock, knock. You know, like something like that. That'd be great. Do the saving now. That's way more important. Do the knock-knock joke later. But I just want to read you guys a couple, a couple of famous people, their, their last words. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, some of you might know of him. Uh, he turns out he was a perfectionist to the end. He says, I have offended God and mankind because my work did not meet the quality it should have. <laughs> and if you know anything about the work that he did, it's pretty high quality, <laughs> which means I don't have a shot. Like, take, I'm never allowed to hold a pencil again or, or build anything ever again. Uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, he wrote Sherlock Holmes. He was in his garden when he died, him and his wife. He turned over to his wife and he said, you are wonderful. And then he had a heart attack and he died. How precious is that, right? John Wayne, the man's man, right? He was 72 when he died in Los Angeles. He, he turned to his wife and she had just asked him, do you know who I am? And he said, of course I know who you are. You're my girl and I love you. John Wayne, right? To the end, John Wayne. Like, of course, that's going to be John Wayne's last words, right? Like, he's just the coolest dude ever. Frank Sinatra, he said, I'm losing it. That was it. Nostradamus, he, he predicted, made a bold prediction. He said, tomorrow at sunrise, I will no longer be here. And he was correct. He was absolutely correct. This one's kind of funny. I know death's not funny, but this one's kind of funny. Uh, Richard B. Mellon, he's a millionaire, and nobody knows him, it's, but the story's funny. Uh, he and his brother Andrew had this game going where they play tag, right? The only weird part about it is they played it for 70 years, right? And so uh, Richard is dying, and he calls his brother Andrew over to the bedside, and he looks up at him, and he says, last tag. And he tags him, and then he dies. So that means he wins, right? That means he won the game. That, that's, how, that's just how that works. And then finally... Uh, Bessie Smith, a famous blues singer, I think she had it right. She said, I'm going, but I'm going in the name of the Lord. I like that. I'm going to try to remember that one because I want to say that one. That's the best one. It's important to us, the last thing we say. It, that's how these people are remembered. I've never heard of Bessie Smith before, before. Now I know she's a famous jazz singer, but if she wouldn't have said that as her last words, I never would have known anything about her. But Jesus is a little bit different. He's not dying. He's ascending. Those are different. Right? He already did the dying thing. He'd been there, done that, got a t-shirt, already beat that guy. And now he's, he's ascending. So he can, he's got some time to think about, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to say this. This is what I'm going to leave him with. It's on purpose. It's not an accident that he says this. It's, it's meant for this exact moment. 
He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Well, what, what does that, that mean? Well, he's, he's leaving, but he's not leaving us alone, right? So that's important to remember. He, he is going. He's going to be with God, and that's awesome, but he's not leaving us alone, which is even awesomer, not a word, more awesome, more awesome, awesomer. It's even awesomer. He's not leaving us alone. He's sending something, something amazingly powerful to be with us. He's sending the Holy Spirit to dwell right here, right? No, God doesn't live in a building or a box anymore. He lives right here. Amen. That's, that's world changing. So if God's going to live with us inside of us, what are we supposed to do with that power? It's kind of a two-stage statement, he says. You know, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit uh, comes to you, and then you'll be my witnesses. What does that mean? I remember like a couple years ago, LeBron James, uh, his, his big tagline was, we are all witness, right? Like he's the best basketball player ever. He just is Seth. I'm sorry. He's the greatest basketball player ever. <laughs> Seth and I had this argument going about LeBron James, Michael Jordan. Seth, I found out LeBron scored more points in Jordan in the playoffs with less shots. Thank you. Thank you. Can I get an it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, Cleveland. No. No, you don't get the No. No, you don't get the cle- Who let him in? Pest Scott leaves for a week. and you- No, it doesn't matter, Seth. Okay, so that, wasn't rhetor- that was a rhetorical thing, Seth. I don't need you to talk back to me here. <laughs> These kids getting out of hand. These kids getting out of hand. So two-part, right? We, we receive the Holy Spirit, and then we're supposed to do something about it. It's not get it and sit on your hands and don't ever talk about it to anybody and be really quiet and timid and just, oh, yeah, I, I, I believe that. That's not what he's saying. He's saying you're going to be our, my witness, Jesus' witness to, to where? Well, he says these city names that we're not very familiar with. You might know the name, but if I pulled out a map, you might be able to tell me where Jerusalem was, but probably not Judea and Samaria, right? Like if I told you to show me where those were on a modern-day map, it would be pretty difficult. Um, but what he's talking about is their circles. We've talked about this before, right? So there's like the, the town and then the city and then the, you know, state. I'm just changing a little bit of terms here, but then like a country and then to the ends of the earth. We can understand that one. That one's not difficult. So it's a really big job if you think about it. And, and it, it, it makes me nervous. It makes me shaky. Oh, well, it makes me more shaky than normal. If you know me, I shake a lot all the time. I'm not nervous. That's just how much I shake. I don't know why, something's wrong with me, maybe I'll, I'll probably die when I'm 30, sorry Christina, but uh, I know that's just how it goes, it's worst, no, how it, worst case of shakes ever, the do, I went to the doctor and they told me that it was the worst case ever, but uh, ever, I'm, I, ever, and they've ever seen him in their, in their life, and the same doctor Pastor Scott goes to, I think they just tell everyone that they have the worst case of whatever it is, and then they come back and I don't know how that works, but it's a big job if you think about it, it's, it's scary for me to think that um, that part of God's plan involves me because I know me. Like I know, I know me, and 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 I'm. I can't do that. I just can't. I've told you before, like in in middle school and high school, I I could not get in front of people and say three words. I if I had a project, I'd read it off my cue card, and just word for word. I can't do all this. I can't do this. I, this job is too big for me. But it's not too big for God. Amen. And how cool is it that he chooses to use us? Like he could have done it any other way. Any other way. But he chooses us. He lets us be a part of it. It's amazing. It just, I can mess up the simplest of tasks. I was literally, this is, this is dumb, okay? I was holding a glass of water yesterday. I'm sitting down. I'm sitting holding a cup of water, and I spilled it. Just holding it like this, all of a sudden it just went out of my hand. I tried to catch it, flipped it, and then it spilled everywhere. I wasn't, we, were, we were just watching a TV show, and it spilled. I was like, how in the world, how did I pull that off? Well, because I'm basically a failure. Basically, that's what it is. But, but, but Jesus isn't a failure, and he likes to take failures and turn them into his own. And I think that's pretty cool. So basically what I'm saying is if anybody, if any of us get the opportunity to lead someone to Jesus, to get to be a witness for Jesus, uh, don't forget it's really not us doing that. 
It's, it's, it's God working through us. There, there's nothing worse than a, than a, a overly proud Christian, right? Right, right? Someone, I'm very humble. I'm very, very humble. Are you? Because I feel like if you say that, you're not. But whatever. I'm not going to. We won't work on that. Okay, so his last words, which mean a lot, are to tell us to go out and, and minister to the world, basically. Be his witness to the entire world. So that's the final words. Now there's a call to action. After the final command, Jesus ascends to heaven, and he, he's, he's gone, right? He's up there, and they're all just like, because let's be real, if you just saw Jesus ascend to heaven, you'd probably just be staring up at the sky like, is it turkeys that when it rains, they look up and they'll drown to death? Yeah, tur- yeah, yeah, that'd be me. I'd just be there like, did you guys just, did you see that just happen? Like, it doesn't matter how much time you spend with them. I feel like if, when you see that happen, you're just going to be blown away, right? And so they're standing there doing what? Nothing. Just standing there. And these guys show up, and they're wearing white, and they say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go. So I'm going to translate that. I'm going to use all my expert knowledge, uh, all my uh, linguistic skill to, to translate this for you, which I have neither of those. So here we go. He's basically telling them, go do what he just told you to do. <laughs> Stop standing here. <laughs> Why are you still here? The, do, the man, capital M, man, the man, just told you what to go do. Get going. He's kicking them in the butt, right? A little, little kick in the pants like, hey, hey, let's go. Chop, chop. Come on, guys. They're, they're a little distracted, right? I mean, I, I, can't, I can't blame them. I get distracted. I've already been distracted 12 times up here. Like, it just happens. That's how I live. I live distracted. Have you guys seen those spinner, the fidget spinners? Oh, my gosh, I love those things. They're amazing. So I'm, I'm riding my longboard uh, down the street the other day. There's this kid out. He's like eight. And he yells at me. He goes, hey. And I'm thinking, like, something's wrong, you know? I'm like, oh, man. So I stop. I'm like, yeah, what's going on? He goes, I have a spinner. <laughs> Holds it up. And, and most of them have three sides, but this one has four. And he goes, then it has four sides. I'm like, that's so cool. And he goes, do you want to spin it? And inside I'm like, yeah, I do so much, so much. But then I realized like 26-year-old dude walking into 8-year-old kid's yard like maybe a little weird. And so like I took a step that way. I was like, no, nah, I don't want to get arrested today. And I, and I said, uh, I said, I got to go. I made an excuse. I got to go down here and do something else. But thanks. Thanks, buddy. No problem. He's like, all right, see you later. And I was like, that's the coolest thing ever. I don't know, fidget spinners, they're great. They're distracting. Sometimes I need distraction. Other times, um, it really gets in the way, right? So there's plenty to be distracted by. In fact, um, I don't know if there's ever been a time in history where it's been easier to be distracted. And, and I'm, not saying that it, I'm not saying that life was easier back in the day. I'm saying there's different difficulties today, right? There's kids, I mean, 10-year-olds and younger with phones and distractions right in your pocket. It's on your wrist. It's everywhere, right? It, the, the good part about the internet is you can get any information you need just like that. The bad part about it is you can get all the distraction you want just as quickly, just as quickly. We live in a world uh, that would, would like to have you surgically attached to your devices, right? To st- stuck to them, stuck to your social media, which, by the way, I can't stand. Stuck to your social media, wondering uh, how many followers do I have, how many likes did that picture get, instead of thinking about, I wonder how I'm sitting with God. <laughs> I wonder how my spiritual walk is going. See, it's a lot easier to be distracted by we, we think it's going to be these big, huge things that, in your life, right? I tell the kids, like, when you're, when you're going to go, uh, when you're looking for somebody to, because the kids, you know, they like to date. And I'm like, well, when you look for someone you're going to date, um, if someone that comes into your life that's just totally abrasive, right, that, you, that just right off the bat you can tell, not for me, that's not the person I'm worried about uh, one of the kids getting in trouble with, really, because they know, they can tell, you know, basically put the horns on the person, like, you can tell they're no good, right? But... It's the person that looks good, that talks smooth, that has, that has motives in the background. That's the guy that scares me the most. That, that's, the guy that, that's the guy that can do the most damage. 
Because when we see these flashing red lights, we know don't go that way. We've been trained our whole life, look both ways before you cross the street, right? Don't, don't do this, don't do that. We, we can see that. But what about when somebody you're really close to is say, hey, we could do this. You ever been in prayer and like your phone rings? Or like, or just something happens. Uh, like we were here Saturday night and I was praying and I heard a chainsaw. Immediately. I'm like, oh, I wonder what that's about. Huh. So I got up and I walked around to see what it was about. <laughs> right? It's that, it's that simple. It's, it's that easy. Some of you are distracted right now. Right now, some of you are distracted. What was that, like 30 seconds? What do you guys think? It wasn't a minute. 30 seconds? Some of you, that killed you. You're sitting there like, what's happening? Why is he sitting there? Why is he saying anything? Is he okay? What's wrong? Is everything okay? Trying to get up? Is he, what, what's going on? Did you know that radio talk shows have this uh, alarm system that they use? And if there's more than seven seconds of dead air, that the, uh, the people who run the organization get uh, like a notification that that happened? Right? So, like, if you have a radio show and you don't say something for seven straight seconds and there's nothing, your bosses know immediately. Nobody has to call it in. There's an automated system to do that. Seven seconds. That's it. That's it. That blows me away because we have, we have to stop uh, taking what's right in front of us and what's easy because distraction's easy. You, whatever you're doing on your phone is easy. The hard issue is looking into your, into your soul, into yourself, right? That's the hard part. And when, when life gets difficult, a lot of times we like to just push it aside. We'll deal with it later. I'm going to do this thing that's not very important right now. But your salvation matters. How you treat other people matters. How you live in front of your kids and kids, how you treat your family and how you live in front of your friends, it matters. What you say at work that you wouldn't say at church <laughs> matters. What you post on social media that you wouldn't ever say to someone face to face. How you represent this place and even further on God out in this world matters. Because it's a really hostile time to be a Christian. Right? It's, uh, I've told you before when I was a junior in college, um, I had a friend who found out I was a Christian. We were in class one day, and the teacher was, uh, I just couldn't take it anymore, and I had to speak up because they were just shredding Jesus, and I just, I couldn't do it. And, and after class, the kid looked over at me, and he's like, are you a Christian? And I said, yeah. And he said, oh, I thought you were smart. <laughs> that literally, I'm not making that up. Oh, I thought you were smart. And, I, and he, I think he genuinely meant what he said. I don't think he meant that as like a, Oh, you're an idiot. I think he just meant like, oh, I, could, I can't believe you could be a Christian and have some kind of intelligence. It just blows me away. So, school's supposed to be more important than God. You know, my intelligence is supposed to be more. And I'm not saying don't go to school, kids. School, stay in school. School is good. Go to college. Trust me, school is good. The problem is, with these good things, is when they get above God, right, when we take God out of them. Because a lot of good things can distract us from God. Your, your work, your job, it's great that you have a job, right? You have money, you can feed your family, you can go buy things, that's awesome. You can tithe, right, right, yeah, right, right, you can tithe. That's good. But what about if your work becomes more important than, than your salvation? Or your family, What if you compromise your values? What if you compromise everything you believe in for a family member? What if that steals yourself? Which one's more important, right? I know that's hard. That's tough stuff. What about church? 
Church can get in between you and God. Right? The busyness of church. Got to get this done. Got to do this. Got to do that. Well, why are you doing that to, to minister to people? Or are we just doing this because when we're busy, we feel good? All of those distractions. I mean, there's, there's so many things in life that, that pull us away. There's a story. Uh, it's, it's cool. I like this one. So Jesus goes to this house for dinner, and uh, there's these sisters there. There's Martha and Mary. And uh, Martha is buzzing around, and she is cleaning and cooking and serving, and she's doing all these things. And none of those things are bad. Right? When you have a guest at your home, you should be nice to them. You should cook for them all that stuff. And none of that's really bad. But the guest wasn't just like a normal dinner guest. Like Jesus is at her house. And she's buzzing around doing all these things. And in classic sibling style, uh, she comes over and she says to Jesus, I have this written down. It's great. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. Because Mary has been sitting at the feet of Jesus, just soaking up everything he has to say. Now, she might look lazy to somebody that's working at the house. What's worse, siblings, than if you're cleaning and your sibling is getting away with not having to clean, right? That's what our married couples, what's worse than when you're cleaning and, the, and your spouse isn't cleaning with you and you're like, are you just sitting down watching TV? Like you've seen that rerun of Sports Center three times in a row, just get up and run the vacuum. Good, no, good Lord. Amen, right? Thank you. Thank you. Yep. But which one of them's distracted? See, Jesus is there. And Mary is, is sitting at, at his feet, just soaking it up, right? And Martha's missing it. She's not missing it for something bad. She's missing it for just what's around her. And Jesus says, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. I want to key in on that. Few things are needed, and then he clarifies even more, or indeed only one. If I told you you only needed one thing in your life, what's the, what's the first thing you think of? Exactly. He won't take from her <laughs> what, what she chose. I love it. It's, it's great. I th- used to think of this story, and I'd read it, and I was like, oh, Martha, you got burned. Like, oh, my goodness, you should have known what was right. Like, how could you not know Jesus was there? Like, and then now I think about it, and um, it makes me really sad. Because if she could get distracted when Jesus was sitting in her living room, It just makes me think about all the people that I know who are so distracted that God's not even on their radar. And it just breaks my heart. This distraction thing is is a big deal. And it's only a big deal because Jesus is a bigger deal. He's such a big deal that the enemy doesn't want you to get to him. Let's put a barrier there. But really, he, he can only do what we let him, right? So he's got to kind of weasel his way in and, and trick us and lie to us and, and convince us that, that this thing is more important, that this distraction is worth your time, that, that you need to handle this right now and you can deal with your salvation and your relationship with Jesus later. But I just want to stop and, and tell you guys right now that you can't wait until later. It's too important. It's too important to procrastinate about. And you're looking at the king of procrastination. But it's too important to put off. I love, I don't remember the song, if you remember Jimmy Yellett, but there's a, he says, uh, um, come today, there's no reason to wait. Right? Yeah, come to the altar. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Whatever reason you're thinking about that's keeping you from Jesus, it's not worth it. It just isn't. And I don't know how any other way to tell you that. That was a sidebar, sorry. 
The last thing they do is uh, they go into constant prayer. This is cool. This is very cool. Hang with me here. So um, the apostles, they return to Jerusalem from the hill uh, called Mount of Olives on the Sabbath day. They arrive. They go upstairs to the room where they were staying, and then they list all the people that were there. And at the end, it says they all join together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So they get the kick in the pants. They go back to Jerusalem. And they go up into uh, the place they're staying, and what do they do? They join together constantly in prayer. That's pretty cool. I like that. I like that that's the first thing that they did. Remember, that's the first. They, they didn't talk about a plan, about this world. No, they, they, they went and they spent time in constant prayer. I think a lot of times we underestimate the value of prayer. Um, we don't pray... A lot of times, and I'm just blanket statementing, so don't be offended, please. Or be offended, really, it won't change what I'm going to say. So, um, see, that's a little Patrick Scott coming out in me right there. That was a little, I listened to him, he's got me being a fighter now. But they, uh, what we do is we pray last. We wait until there's no other hope, there's no other chance, and, and we, then we pray. <laughs> We say, have you ever said, there's nothing else I can do about this, so I'm just going to pray about it. Why did you wait until then? Why would you wait until you exhausted every other avenue? Pray about it first, and second, and third. Constant prayer. Well, constant means continual, right? Don't wait until it's, it's long gone and all hope is lost. Pray first. It, yeah, second, third, and fourth, just pray. This, listen to some verses. I just pulled a couple of verses out about the power of prayer. Matthew 7, 7, it says, Ask and it will be given to you, and you will find, knock, and it will be open to you. James 5, 16, it says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. There's real power in prayer legitimate power in prayer. I can't say it any more. I can't dress it up any more than that. There's real power in prayer. It's actually the most powerful weapon we have in our arsenal against the enemy. There's nothing bigger that we have. Think about it. It's a direct line of connection between you and the creator of the universe. That's amazing. That's crazy blows my mind. It, it really does. We, we've been having these uh, prayer meetings on Saturday nights here, and it's been awesome to see people come out and give up a little bit of their Saturday to pray. It's cool. And by the way, if you're living your faith and it's not requiring you to give something up in your life, to sacrifice something, you probably need to check how you're living your faith. Because if it costs Jesus something, it better cost us something. Because I'm, no, I'm not better than that guy. <laughs> Tell you what, I'm, no, I'm not better than him. So if he had to suffer, then I expect that to have to give up and sacrifice as well. And it's been awesome to see people come out and pray at that. Um, it, it's really chill. It's laid back. We just have a little light music in the background and the li- a couple of lights are up and people just come in and pray. I've seen families come in. I've seen uh, just individuals, kids, adults. It's been awesome. And if you, if you haven't been able to make it to that, I would highly encourage you to this, this week is the last one because next week is Pentecost Sunday. I would highly encourage you to, to make the time for that. Uh, I, no pressure. Like I know Pastor Scott was saying no pressure about any of that, but I would really love to see, especially on this Saturday night, to see this place uh, filled up with people praying, praying, and praying. Because what the disciples did when they went back is they prayed. And they waited. And they prayed, and they waited, and they prayed, and they waited. And then all of a sudden, there wasn't any more waiting. Like the Holy Spirit shows up, and it changes, it changes the history of the world. It changes it forever. It shows up and, and gives, gives a motivation, gives, gives power to this movement, right? To, to Jesus' mission on this earth. Imagine if we spent all week in prayer 
and met up here Saturday night in prayer and then met here Sunday morning in worship for the Holy Spirit working in this place. Imagine what would happen if we did that. It would change, it would change us forever. I, I, have no, I have no doubt in my mind saying that. It would change us forever. And so I do this thing every week with the youth group. Uh, after I'm done speaking, I like to give them a challenge. I like to say, this is what you're challenged this week to do. If you, if you didn't get anything else from this message, uh, here's what I want you guys to do. So here's your challenge. Fight the distractions that are around you. They're going to be there. Why are you fighting them? You're fighting them so, so you can have an effective prayer life. Amen. That's why. To have an effective prayer life. And why, why, why have an effective prayer life? <laughs> to improve your own connection to God and in turn improve how he works through this place and through this community. It all, it all piles on each other. It's like building a foundation and, and prayers right at, right at the foundation of that. Imagine if we just spent, if we ended service today, but if we just kept praying and all week. And then Pastor Scott comes in on Sunday and he's like, what happened here? And then we'll be like, we just prayed all week. Like we just didn't stop. It was crazy. We just kept praying. He walked in Saturday night and there's a huge group of people here praying for, praying for the God to work in this place. That's, that's really like, that's what our, as a staff, that's what our job is, right? Like that's, our job is to support the big man, being Pastor Scott, right? Not big, but like, you know, he's in charge. I didn't mean it like that. Don't nobody tell him I said that, like that. Or I'm going to put this on video. I didn't mean it like that, all right? It's to support him and his vision and, and, and the vision that's been leading us to this. The whole reason we've been doing these prayer meetings and all those things is, I tell you, on Mondays, we'll just sit in there and we'll just throw out, we'll just talk about where this is going. And, and we really, I really feel like this is going in a great direction. And I feel like these prayer meetings and I feel like Pentecost Sunday is going to be a huge step off day for the future of what we do. This is a call to action. We're not to, we're not to sit around and just wait for, for this church thing to happen, for this God thing to happen. This is a call to action. To take up what Jesus has told us to do. To answer, respond to his final words. And to tell people the best news they're ever going to hear. It's the greatest thing anybody's ever going to hear. How cool is that? We get to deliver it.